and teaches courses on LIR, IPv6, and routing re registry. She'll be talking about how to survive IPv4 depletion and IPv6 deployment in RPKI. So round of applause for Natalie Treneman. Is this working? Is mic wor yeah, the mic's working, great. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm very honored to be at the Women in Tech um, Day here at the Campus Party Europe. I walked around during the, uh, during the event today. Very impressive, very inspiring. Um, as I was introduced, I work for the RIPE NCC as a trainer. Um, RIPE NCC is the European organization that gives out IP addresses. You might have heard something about IP addresses running out. Um, I'm going to tell you what the current status is, not only in our region, but also worldwide, and what the current plan is with IPv6 and the current uptake. Uh, first, a bit of introduction on uh, who we are. So we're RIPE NCC, and a lot of people think I work for RIPE, but RIPE is a different thing. RIPE is a community uh, of people with an interest in the internet making rules for giving out IP addresses. So it's an open community who makes policies in a bottom-up fashion. So um, the RIPE community can be anybody, anybody with an email address, can participate, make, help make deciding the rules to give out addresses. That is RIPE. I work for RIPE NCC, which stands for Réseau IP Européen, uh, NCC Network Coordination Center. And we are actually an organization, member-based. We currently have 9,500 members, and those are mostly internet providers. And recently, we saw a bit of a tilt in who our members are, because we see governments now also becoming members of us, asking for their own IP addresses. Um, we are based in Amsterdam. I'm Dutch, as you can probably hear from my accent. And um, we're not for profit. That means that the members, first of all, get to decide how much they pay to us every year in a general meeting. Um, and uh, we are not making any profit. So the more members we get, probably the lower the membership fee is. That's a bit the idea. Um, five regional internet registries worldwide. I'll show you where they are. As you can see, we're pretty big, 74 countries. and. Uh, 9,500 members, almost. Quite big. The other ones are Efrinic and uh, APNIC, LACNIC, and Erin for America. Quickly going through this, uh, I hope you all know what an IP address is. Uh, that helps me uh, a bit speeding up the presentation. These are the things that we give out. So uh, if a European organization needs IP addresses, or an autonomous system number, they have to become a member from us in order to get that. That is one of the services we provide strictly to our members. We provide some other services uh, also to uh, non-members. One of the most known one is the RIPE database. There we go. The RIPE database is um, a database where we put all the IP addresses in. It's basically like a phone book, um, but for IP addresses. And that is open for everybody. If you just go to dot, 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 ripe net, you can see a search box, type in an IP address, and if it's from our region, it will show you who the legitimate holder of that address space is. That's one of the services we provide also to non-members. Um, training services, well, I'm a trainer, so I travel around Europe, Middle East, uh, Russia, to teach internet providers and governments, our members, on how to implement IPv6, for example, but also how to correctly use the RIPE database, one of the things we do. So training, RIPE database, we do two other important things at the moment, the K-root, I'm not going to talk much about root servers, but there are 13 root servers uh, that operate the internet, we run one of them, and we're building the world's largest internet measurement uh, project, atlas.ripe.net. And we do that with little boxes that people can hook up on the internet, and then you can have a look how fast your internet is uh, from all points, vantage points in the world. So that's what we're also doing. Pretty cool project. But I'm here mostly to talk about IPv4. 
So quickly going into that. Um, you know him probably. This is Mr. Fint, Fint Surf. Mr. Fint Surf, um, he was keynote speaker here earlier in the week. He invented IPv4 in the late 70s. And um, when he invented IPv4, together with some other people, they um, thought 32 bits was enough. 4.3 billion addresses was enough. That was the whole idea. It was not meant to do what it does today. It was only for a research project, basically. Things got a bit out of hand, so um, yeah. IPv4, 32 bits, it used to be enough. We all know where that went. Then another guy, I would like to, uh, another gentleman, I have to say. This gentleman is called John Postel. And back in the old days, if you worked for IBM or Xerox or Microsoft, you would just pick up the phone if you needed IP addresses. And you would call John. And he would say, dear John, I need IP addresses. And John would ask, do you need a class A, class B, or class C? And I believe they still teach that in universities, class A, B, and C. Yeah. So class A, 16 million addresses. Class B, 65,000 addresses. Class C, 256 addresses. You pick your choice. And John would write down the amount that you got in a book or in a text file, plain text file. And as you can imagine, in the 90s, Mr. Postel got a bit busy with all these companies calling him, asking for IP addresses, class A, class B. Almost nobody asks for a class C. So Mr. John Postel founded IANA, and IANA is the governing body that gives out, used to give out slash eight blocks, because he needed a bit more colleagues to do that. Then in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, in Europe, uh, there were some people who thought, Maybe we can help John a bit and um, arrange things more in a regional matter. So this is how RIPE was formed. It basically was to take over some functions from Mr. Postel. So we started giving out. By that time, also people thought, OK, class A, B, and C, maybe that's not the best idea. Maybe we should tailor it a bit more. And that's when the slash notation came into more fashion. So if you needed, uh, let's say, slash 23, which is 500 addresses, you could get 500 addresses instead of a slash 16, 65,000. Anyway, lots of addresses. This is the IANA pool, as you can see, empty. On the 3rd of February, 2011, well that's more than two and a half years ago, the IANIC pool got depleted. No more slash eights to be given out to the regional internet registries. They did it with a big press ceremony. They gave each regional internet registry, for example, RIPE, NCC, but also ERIN, and also Afrinic, and also the others. Each one they gave one slash eight. Here you go. This is the last one. Good luck. The end. So officially, IANA has completely depleted IPv4. And then, of course, it takes a while before the regional internet registries run out. My organization, RIPE NCC, run out of IPv4 addresses. A lot of people still don't believe that. But actually, already last year, and it's close to the date of today, uh, 14 September 2012, RIPE NCC gave out their regular pool of addresses. So if BT comes to us and says, please give us a slash 16, or give us 65,000 addresses, we say, sorry, gone. We simply don't have it. There was one thing with that last slash eight that we got from IANA. And our community said, you know what? You should spend that wisely. So for that last slash eight that we got on the 3rd of February, there's a different rule set. I'll show you a bit in a minute how each registry, or if you start your own business today, how you can still get a little bit of IPv4. It's important, um, but ha this is how it looks worldwide at the moment. So it's getting really tight. APNIC were the first ones, Asia Pacific was the first region to run out of IPv4. Um, that happened already in 2011. 
And as you can see, that little red line, that is the threshold for that last slash eight. They also have a separate rule set for that last slash eight. So it goes a bit slower. Um, Erin and Leknik, Latin America, they are scheduled to run out somewhere next year. And I didn't put a red line there because they don't have a special reservation for that last slash eight. So basically, when Erin hits rock bottom, they hit rock bottom, the end. They just simply have not got one address to give out. Same goes for Leknik. Now you see us with that little red line. Um, that's our last slash eight. So since the 14th of September, this is what we have. We still have given out some space. And then we have an interesting one, Efrinik. Um, I wish I was living in Africa for this one. Uh, Efrinik has um, a lot of address, IPv4 address space. But there currently is no transfer policy between the RARs. Between these organizations, there is no way to transfer addresses from, for example, Efrinik to our region. Um, there is one transfer policy at the moment, and that is between Erin, so America, and Asia Pacific. These two re continents, basically, can exchange addresses. For the others, there's nothing arranged yet. I do believe this will come over time. This is that last slash 22 I was talking about. This is a bit the, um, here we have the, uh, the slide with the, dis with the distribution system. We have IANA who's grayed out because they simply don't have V4 space anymore. The regional internet registry, well in this example, RIPE NCC, um, we have depleted the regular pool. We can only give out one slash 22, and that's, 20, uh, that's 1,024 IPs per member, one time. So it doesn't matter how big you are, if you're Telefonica, Spain, or if you're a small hosting provider, we all treat them equally. You come to us, you can ask for only one slash 22. That's it. So as you can see, this can become quite a problem. When I do a training course on IPv6 and I ask the members in my room, how much V4 do you still have? How long can you extend with the, with the pool that you have? The general answer is between one, two, three years. So between one and three years, what they have on stock. After that, basically, the next generation coming up doesn't have public IPv4 available anymore. So all the things that our people that our people that are developing here uh, for the Internet of Things, etc., simply cannot be hooked up to the Internet in our region as we know it today. So that's an important one. Um, to get that last uh, slash 22, we do have some rules. First of all, the member that comes to us for that last block of V4 must have already got V6. And the second one is, you have to justify how you're going to use it. Not too difficult. Two requirements. And since 2012, we have given out a bit over 2,000 uh, of these last slash 22s. We've got 9,500 members, so there are quite some members that still have to come pick up their last slash 22. But first of all, they have to get a V6 block before they can request that last bit of IPv4. So, what if you need more IPv4? Because a lot of CEOs say, well, I don't care that RIPE NCC has run out. I know there are organizations out there who have a lot of address space and don't use it. Can't we have it? And this is where things can get nasty. Because first of all, you're going to put a market price on IPv4, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you're also postponing the rollout of IPv6. So what if you need more? Well, one thing not to do is to go to eBay and buy your blocks there. For a couple of reasons, this is a pretty bad idea. First of all, um, you don't know who the legitimate holder of that space is, if they claim to be who they say they are. Second of all, it could be blacklisted in the past or even now. Um, 
you could have problems with the geolocation, for example. All these kind of little things. Maybe it's not even unique space that you're buying because they sold it already to another guy. You simply don't know. So, bad idea, don't go for that. Our community said, okay, it will happen anyway that people will buy and sell IPv4 address space. So we better make some rules for that. So they did. They made a policy proposal. It got accepted. Uh, and it allows tra to transfer unused allocations to other members, but only between members. The minimum size is the slash 22. And there's a reason they put a minimum size on the transfers. And this is mainly to protect the global routing table. Because we currently have in IPv4, do you know how many entries in the global routing table? Half a million. Half a million individual entries in the global routing table. So that's a lot. And in order to prevent of it blowing up, minimum size slash 22. We evaluated. So we are basically, in this case, the man in the middle who looks at it and says, OK, you're the legitimate holder of that space. You need it. Are you both members? Uh, hasn't the space been sold in the last two years? Because that is one of the additional rules. If you buy space, you can't sell it off for the next two years. Little things. And we update it in the RIPE database. We don't charge any money for this transfer, just to even things out. Because we're neutral, we're impartial, we don't care. Our biggest job is to make sure that we know who the legitimate holder is. So we don't make too much fuss about this. Um, we even provided a listing service. We even made our own eBay on our website, where our members can log in and put their blocks up for transfer. And this is a grab of the offered IPv4 space at the moment. And I can tell you uh, the list of requested IPv4 didn't fit on the slide, because there is a huge demand for IPv4 space at the moment. Um, the current market price, I only happen to know because I teach people and I ask them, uh, is currently around 10 euros per single IP address. 10 euros. Yeah. So, I know a guy who recently bought a slash 17. And I asked him, are you crazy? He paid three, 300,000, no, 300,000, 20,000, 320,000 euros for it. I said, that's a lot? He said, yes, I know. But I, with a router, if I buy a router for that price, I write it off in six, seven years. If I buy this block, I don't know when I will write it off, but it's probably not going to be five, six, seven years. I'll probably use it for longer. That's a bit of a gamble, you don't know, but that's, that's a business case you have to make or not. Anyway, I do understand if people have to buy IPv4 in order to dual stack the network uh, to run also v6. We're going there. What we also see, since the price of IPv4 addresses is going up, is brokers. Maybe you have received already emails, or your organization has received emails. They're, these guys are pretty aggressive, sending you emails saying, you have space, can we buy it from you? Uh, or we have somebody who wants to buy it from you. Can you trust these people? Tricky. Um, what we do is um, we made a list on our website with brokers who agreed to work according to the right policies. That's all we can do. Because we're neutral and impartial, and if people want to be a broker, it is allowed. Um, so, yes, you might be, appro be getting approached by brokers in the future. This is where the RIPCC stand. We are backed out of this. The community made the policy for the transfers. We didn't agree, uh, we didn't set a market price. The community out there, the market made the market price. Our job is to make sure, in the end, is this holder the legitimate holder for that IPv4 address space? And also for IPv6, of course. So that's what we do. That's why we don't charge any money for it. Um, it. But we prefer, well, it has to go through us. Nasty story. It's 
it's going to be expensive. And um, I will talk about the threats, the real threats of the IPv4 depletion right after this section. Um, because we all know that we have to go to IPv6 at one point in time. Because simply, only 35% of the people are connected to the internet. And there's a whole generation uh, and, and whole countries getting connected to the internet. And we simply don't have the means to connect all these people to the internet on IPv4. Also, things like uh, the Internet of Things. You may have heard some presentations this week about it. Um, one example for is Porsche, the car. Uh, they're doing some pretty cool stuff. They are looking at implementing IPv6 in their cars for the electronic stuff. If the electronics of a car break uh, while, you're, while you're driving, you go to the side of the road, and basically the garage can log in to the, uh, to the electronics and fix it. That can be done over V6. The only thing is you need to have a connection over V6. That's a different story. But Porsche is looking at implementing these kind of things. Um, we don't know how the internet looks like in five years. 20 years ago, we didn't even have internet. Five years ago, we started getting the first smartphones. We don't know where we are in five years. And this is where things get really tight. Because we don't have any IPv4 in five years. As the provider said, we have one, two, three years. That's it. Uh, IPv6, this is how we distribute it. We distribute big. And this is something where network operators have difficulty getting their heads around, how big the blocks are that we throw at them. Um, first of all, IANA, the governing body, only has slash three. They don't have all the IPv6 space in the world. This is only one eighth. Seven eighth of the IPv6 address space is still with the Internet Architecture Board, the people who developed IPv6. They only gave one eighth to IANA to distribute. Um, they gave each regional Internet registry a slash 12. And the slash 12 is a lot, I can tell you. And from that slash 12, we give out slash 32's minimum size, slash 32, to the local internet registries, our members. And to give you a bit of an idea how big a slash 32 is in IPv6, it has 4.3 billion subnets. And as you know, the internet in IPv4 is 4.3 billion addresses. So we are giving basically every local internet registry, every of our members, more addresses than currently we have in V4. And it's just a small fraction of that slash 12. So it's incredibly big. And that was exactly the idea. Because IPv6 was actually designed for the Internet of Things. Designed for uh, 4G, designed for things that we have no idea about today. That is the biggest difference in concept from IPv4. IPv4, when it was designed by FinSurf, it was designed for a little project. That's the big difference. A bit about the addresses, to get a bit of an idea how big it is. Um, 128 bits, we work with hexadecimals. So not only with the numbers, we now have much longer numbers, but we also include letters, A to, a to F. So that gives us more combinations. Minimum size a device should get is a slash 64. And that is already more addresses than I can pronounce. It's a long. Why am I giving a phone so many addresses today? And the real answer is we don't know. We don't know what this phone can do in three, four, five years. So we have to get used to that mindset that we're throwing IP addresses at things that are not doing much more than what they do today. Completely different mindset from IPv4. So that is why if your provider starts offering IPv6 to your house, you might end up getting uh, up to a slash 48, 65,000 subnets. Now, the providers say, okay, for a residential user, maybe 65,000 
subnets, blocks of addresses, is a bit overkill. So let's give each house 256 blocks of addresses. And today that is considered as good practice. So that you have enough subnets to hook up your fridge, for example, your light bulbs. Uh, and I'm actually trying to do these things at home. I'm actually trying to uh, install IPv6 in my house. And I tell you, it's not an easy job because there's not much v6 out there yet. Um, yesterday I ordered IP6 capable light bulbs. Well, it appeared that the light bulbs were not IP6 capable, but there was a gateway that was talking to the light bulbs. But it did v6. Um, webcams, for example, for the front door, you can buy them on IP6, 500 euros. Simple consumer webcam. Uh, nobody's going to do these things. Thermostats, difficult, uh, only in Germany. So if you're in Germany, you can have an IP6 cable thermostat. Otherwise, no luck. So it's going extremely slow, and I'll show you how slow. We have this rating system to measure our members, how they're doing with V6. Interesting graph coming up. Um, we measure if they have a V6 block from us. We measure if they announce it on the internet, so if it's visible. We measure if they have reverse DNS and if they have a route object. And with each of these things, they can get a star. And to push them to do v6, we do two little things. First of all, we put them on our website. And the second thing is we send them free t-shirts. Free t-shirts work, we learned. So um, yeah, and it's a very cheap and easy way to get uh, some interaction in the classrooms as well. So four stars free t-shirts. This is the status of today. Almost 9,500 members. 37% of them has no IPv6 addresses whatsoever. Don't know what's going on there. Then we see the brown chunk, and this is an interesting block. These are the people who got their IPv6 allocation, but that's it. And probably they got it, to get their hands on that last block of IPv4. No other reason. So, not much movement there. But the purple, the yellow, and the blue, these are organizations, companies, who actually start doing stuff. It doesn't mean they offer IPv6 to their customers yet. It just means that they're building it in their own infrastructure. 20% does that. But how many home users can actually access Google over IPv6, whole different story. That's this one. Um, bit depressing numbers here, I'm afraid. Um, this is a statistic from Google. Google is basically a good measure for that. How many people visit their website over IPv6? And um, some countries are doing okay-ish. Other countries, not so well. UK is not doing so well. The Netherlands is doing actually really bad. Um, and we have some interesting spots there. For example, here's R Romania. Why Romania? There is one huge internet provider in Romania, basically the uh, incumbent. And they, um, they did something pretty cool. There were two young guys working in their core team. And, uh, and they rolled it out. They just went for it. Two young guys, 25 years old, convince their manager, let's do this. And let's shine Romania on these maps. So they did that. Um, Switzerland also doing good. 9.75%. That's Swisscom. They rolled it out with one push on a button. Uh, most of the home routers of Swisscom did it already. Sip of water. Staring at this. Now, going back to IPv4, um, one big threat today with IPv4 is if you... There never was a rule that it had to be announced on the Internet. So this is why IBM and Apple and all these big companies, Xerox, have a lot of IPv4 space and people think it is not used. It actually is used. Um, 
but not visible on the internet, so they use it as private space. One threat with the depletion of IPv4 is that you get companies who think that space is not used, let's announce that and announce it on the internet. What prevents them? Nothing. So this is where the serious threat lies. What if somebody is just grabbing a chunk of V4, start announcing it, go to an uh, upstream provider, transfer provider, and says, here's a bag of money, please announce this space. OK, sure. RPKI prevents this, because this is a serious threat. Purpose of RPKI is can you say, is that AS number authorized to originate that prefix on the internet? Because today, that answer is not easy to give. So the Open Standards Organization made some rules to say, OK, this is getting fragile. We have to make some measures in order to fix this, to make sure that the other space that is announced by the internet is supposed to be announced by that organization. RPKI. Basically, we work with five trust anchors. RIPE NCC, APNIC, ERIN, LACNIC. Um, and we give out digital certificates, five trust anchors. Basically, it works a bit like SSL-ish. We give a certificate to your resources. It is a digital proof you are the holder of the address space. And I'm um, going to quickly go over this, because this is a very, very technical story. Um, this is the PKI system that we might know from PGP. Um, but what the cool thing is, is in our portal, the LAR can um, basically make claims of this, say, this slash 21 should only be announced as the slash 21, and not as a more specific by another organization. With these claims, um, these claims are called ROAS, um, Route Origin Authorization. You can digitally make these claims, and routers uh, have in their software a way to listen to this and make, um, make statements about that. Do I accept this prefix? Is it trusted? Or do I drop it? In the end, the network engineer is still in charge to make that decision if they want to drop it or if they want to announce it with a lower priority or something. The network engineer will remain in control, but this is where we're heading now. And we see an uptake in the adoption of RPKI. If your provider, if you have space for yourself and your provider comes and says, I should make a ROA for you, then you know what that means. Uh, if you want to play with it, you can go ahead. We have two test beds, RIPE NCC for Cisco, Eurotransit in Germany has a Juniper. You can tell that to them. Have a look, play. Um, same with IPv6. Have a look and play with it. Try to see, ask your provider, how are they doing with IPv6? They don't like that question, because suddenly they have to do things to provide you with an answer. Just a simple question, you know, in the chat dialog. How are you doing with V6? Just to give them a little poke if they are making sure things are getting ready for the future. Conclusions, last slide. The lack of IPv6 implementations is a threat to in innovative ideas and growth. This is true. Everything that people are doing here, um, everything that's being developed, we should make it future-proof. Um, ask your provider and share experiences. And that's it. Happy to take uh, questions. Okay, if you have any questions, if you just want to raise your hands, we can. Anyone? So, uh, thanks very much for a very inspiring talk. So, my question is the following: You have a policy for handing out new IP addresses. Uh, handing out IP, new IPv4 addresses to IPv6 uh, when people have IPv6 addresses. If somebody comes in and wants to trade with somebody else, do they also enforce this policy? Because that was from 2006, I saw. No. Is it something to add that while you still can? 
Please well, do. You should go to the mailing list, right? Exactly. Go to the mailing list. Okay. Uh, excellent idea. Love it. Any more questions? What's your opinion about uh, prefix length for local host and point-to-point uh, -point networks? Because some people say 64. IPv6. Oh yeah. dear. Oh, that debate. Yeah, that I know. is. That's a bit. They're conflicting RFCs at the moment. That's the biggest problem. Um, what I teach people is to actually configure 127, one IP address here, one IP address there, but reserve the full slash 64. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Hello, hello. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, that uh, I can remember my IPv4 number, but IPv6, uh, it, I can't. I, I try to implement it twice, but I can't remember that, that IP address. And uh, um, do you plan some uh, better cooperation with uh, DNS or something like that, that? What will be the service for a na the name service in yeah. the future? What will no. be the evolution of this? I totally agree. DNS is more important than ever with IPv6 because the numbers are so ridiculously long and difficult. Um, there are a couple of ways to make your IP address look a bit easier. Uh, first of all, stateless address configuration builds an IP address, constructs it from your MAC address. And it looks terrible. But if you uh, get a block of IP addresses from your provider, it's like 48, maybe a slash 56, then the number to begin with is already shorter. So for example, 2001 colon DB8, because you don't have to write zero DB8, you can skip a zero, so DB8, one, two, three, four, then that's already 12 numbers to remember. Uh, I agree that for the host, it's a nightmare, and DNS is probably the only answer. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. I have um, a question and a point. You ask uh, how we can have a, a new IPv4. Unfortunately, in the world that we are living now, the big companies, large companies, are buying smaller companies for two reasons, patents and IPv4 range. So that is another option if you have a lot of money and you are a large company. Yeah. So. But um, what we see now is that we see a huge uptake in members. We see we grow 10% membership in a year or something um, because a lot of people want to get their hand on 1,024 IPv4 addresses. And you pay 1,800 euros for that. So there is a business case to start up new members, get IPv4, merge them, and close, close them when they're empty. Yeah. And um, the question is, uh, I'm listening about IPv6 the last 14 years, 15 <laughs> years, when I started uh, studying in the college. But it's uh, still not taking off. And now that we already exhausted IPv4. I know. It's uh, still the future. So um, the question is when finally IPv6 will be the present and will finally take off? Because there are a few hosting companies, a few internet service providers, etc. Then it's possible to use IPv6, but uh, in residential, in, in your house, you cannot use the router, you cannot use uh, but now the operating system kind of, etc. So for how long uh, we need to wait until really IPv6 will take off? Yeah. I wish I had the answer. The thing is, uh, what I'm terribly afraid of, the internet providers that I talk to, they say they have between one and three years, right? I'm afraid well, what they are going to do after that three years. Because I'm, to be honest, I'm terribly afraid that they're not going to do V6 at all, but just create an extra layer of NAT in IPv4 uh, instead of doing IPv6. So that's another possibility. What we're heading for is that providers will just ignore the whole thing for another five years, buy some expensive translator boxes, and just build an extra bubble of net, uh, which prevents you, by the way, from peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, from uh, some other n uh, nice things. Um, so that's, that's a degraded service. Yeah. Thanks. 
okay but uh, those nice things are not nice for everybody maybe uh, isn't it uh, the reason why ipv6 uh, is uh, lending to so, uh, slow slowly because there is all the time the rumor that n80 is a bad yep. we will not support it at ipv6 never but i know the people want it the, uh, and uh, the other part of uh, the story is that actual boxes, when you buy a uh, box to the home, you have firewall on it, not for the IPv6. They're building that now. They're building it. Uh, Swisscom, they in included the firewall for the home user, very simple firewall, but still firewall to the end user, and they do native v6. Uh, they block certain things. And if you know how to unblock them as a consumer, you can. Uh, but by default, some things are closed. Uh, so there is a lot of work there. And um, I do agree um, that the uptake, the net, if I teach people IPv6, they go say like, but you said there is no net. So if there's no net in IPv6, I'm not going to do it because I use net for a number of reasons. Um, an interesting debate because IP6 was designed for end-to-end -end connectivity, blah, 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 and a lot of people, the, the security for IPv6, because the uptake for IPv6 is so slow, the security for IPv6 is even slower. And that's also not helping. Now I have to say, I went to an ITF meeting where they make all these guidelines uh, uh, for uh, RFCs, uh, I've been to that meeting three weeks ago or something, and all you hear is about new RFCs being made to help speed up the security of IPv6 and not exactly do that in IPv6, but find ways that basically do the same thing, but they call it different. So there's a lot of work being done there. And it's a matter of time. Yeah. Thanks. Any more? Thank you, Natalie, for your illuminating talk. Thanks. Um, round of applause for Natalie Treneman. <laughs> and at four o'clock, at four o'clock, we'll be having Miguel Angeles Sotos, who will talk about the best practices guide for how to survive IPv6. Thank you.